In the last five years, you have been privileged to witness many things, but one thing especially, that no other generation of people have ever trodden a thousand miles off. The E-A-T-H death has been televised around the encircling globe at least three times in the last five years. When President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the television went out of business for four or five days and did only one thing, conduct the funeral service attended by the heads of government, communists, Buddhists, Mohammedists, so-called Christians from around the world. America went on a religious bend, the like of which history is never known. In more recent days, Senator John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And again, with not quite so much coverage, but the world attended the funeral of a senator of the United States. A little before that, the Negro leader Martin Luther King, at which people all over the world, through the medium of television, were brought face to face with the last enemy of mankind, the enemy that has not been abolished yet. Death. This dumb preacher was foolish enough to hope that an impression would have been made on people today that it's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judge. Your children watch the four or five day funeral procession. You did. And in two weeks, the world went back to business as usual and forgot that when we get down to brass tacks, there's just one reason, fundamental, beans and cornbread, elemental, why Jesus died on the cross. And that is because men have to die. And after the die, they're brought to judgment. In language that we don't need to interpret, we are told, and, as, it, is, appointed, unto men, once to die, but after that the judgment, for that reason, because that appointment has been made. And God made it. And because he's appointed that men die, and that death introduces them to a meeting with a Christ holy God. The scripture says, So, because of, that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men. 
Now that's just two and two makes four. Don't have to be smart to understand that. Give an hour philosophizing. We leave out this. We're dead wrong. I wish somebody this morning would go away from this building Panicked by the grace and mercy of God, wash in the powerful life laid down blood of God the Son, vitally united to a living Lord. Because you've got to die. And you've got to come to the judgment. I wish this next week, if the week has not brought you to the place, Doing a good deal of praying for yourself. I want to turn to God, you pray for me. All the birth and the crush of living in a day when people live in life that never will die. When it seems we've got smart, we know everything except the very elemental thing. When we're trying to convince somebody to need Jesus. For some other reason, I'll tell you why you need the merits of what he did placed over against your account. Because you're going to die. You're going to die. And you're going to come to the judgment. In my first pastorate, I brought the first sermon ever delivered in the city of Border, Texas. 50,000 people, no church. And I preached in the biggest saloon in the city. I had seven professions of faith. I took them and two others that I could find in that city of 50,000 people, organized the Baptist church, baptized them, and they constituted the charter members. I preached to them on the 7th verse of the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. The whole chapter's description of a funeral procession like of which we saw on television three times in our day. It's a picture of a funeral procession going down a street while everybody's singing in a low note. While men go to their long, while a man goes to his long home, and then the conclusion of the whole business reads like this: Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit to God who gave. And I preached to those people gathered there to trap me and embarrass me. I was trying to raise money and I was having to get it from the saloon and gaming crowd and find anybody else. And they said they wouldn't give me any money till they heard me and got a sample of my preaching and they stood me up on a beer keg and took pictures and surrounded me with deputy sheriffs and all of that. And I preached to them on what's certain for men and women in the future. I'll tell you what's certain, death. And I'll tell you what's certain, judgment. And I preached on what God Almighty is done about that. I'll tell you what he's done. Mercy upon mercy. 
grace upon grace, glory upon glory. Wish we could believe it instead of accept it. God hung the Son of His love on a tree. And He put sin on Him. And I don't understand it. I can quote it, but can't explain it. He not only put sin on Him, but He made Him to be sin. And He did it for sin. And I pled with men and women in the concept of fear. Don't make certain you die out of Christ. Don't come to the judgment. You have to deal with these hands. For the Lord God and the God of the law. Most terrible thing that this preacher can possibly conceive of. Be that stand yonder at the time when men cannot escape howsoever hard they try, says the word of God. When men shall seek the high and call for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them, to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. That time when the great of the earth, the kings and the great of the earth, shall seek to be missing when mankind is summoned to face the God of law and to have to deal with that law himself. When the man that God used as a channel through which he gave the law couldn't keep it himself, Moses, and fell under its sanction and its penalty and made it a bloody substitute or hell for him. Oh, if I just had one sermon and I could get somebody to listen to me, stand on the street corner and have worldwide television and radio and every human being in the world listen that would be the only thing they'd ever hear from God before they went out yonder. I tell you what I'd do. I'd beg them. I'd storm at them as I would you this morning. I'd plead with them. Whatever else you do, bud, all your little alibis, I've heard them. All your excuses, I've heard them. All your reasons, I expect they're pretty good, but in God's name and for your own sake, don't risk facing God, having to look at yourself in the mirror of His holy law that you never would look at down here, and have it like Samson rending the lion jaws, have that thrice holy, good, and just, and perfect law of God. And leave you guilty and headed for hell, amen for hell. Oh, at the judgment, men are going to have to grapple with a law that's so holy that even an omniscient, all wise God couldn't find but one or two ways to deal with it. Hang his own son up and turn him over to his law and watch his law stamp out the very life blood of the king of glory. 
or send everybody to hell. Even God has never found a way to deal with God's holy law except to enforce its awful penalty. You got to die. For the first 16 months of my little ministry, I knew no theology. I'd been an infidel for six years. I went into the public ministry as soon as God saved me. That's all I've ever known. But I lived with death. I was the only preacher in that old city of 50,000 people. I averaged three funerals a day, preaching three funerals a day for 16 months. Then after 16 months, they sent a young preacher in and started the Methodist Church. But for 16 months, the only preacher in that city of sin, 50,000 people, almost as crazy as the people of Houston and Pasadena, almost as mad after everything except the things that count. Oh, I lived with death until that was burned in my soul a little while, a little bit, this their commonplace proposition that I guess is the hardest thing for any human being to actually believe. I almost learned that people die. I just almost learned that people die. God thought to death, so he hung his son on the cross. I wish I could recover. I'm getting so smart, I ain't worth killing. Know so much truth, my shotgun shoots at everybody and hits nobody. I wish I could call myself and you back. Things have their place. Truth has its place and season. But what this generation of people this past is asking you to get involved with yonder in that apartment, house, and home, and where you were? What this generation desperately needs to face, and somebody's going to have to face them with it, is that these desperate they need to get afraid and need to become seekers and need to seek till they find and take not no for an answer. The reason men desperately need to lay hold on God's Son is because they got to die and come to the judgment. Men die. Men die. You can't live as I did, going from one funeral to another, from one house of ill fame, a gaming place, a saloon, a county hospital, a courthouse, or on the streets. As I did, holding the hands of men and women who died by the dozens every day in that ungodly city. Never last one of them, none of them knew my name, but when they had lost all hope, that they could recover. Inevitably, they kept me running my legs off by saying, somebody go get the preacher. And this somebody would sit beside their bed many times as the ghost of a godless, rebellious, into hill life, as the ghost of a wasted life, trapped up and down on their beds. I'd hold their hands as they begged me to keep them out of hell. People die. I suggest we never get from away from just this elemental fact. The gospel story is not an option. 
Christ is not a convenience. He's an earth and necessity. For it's appointed unto men wants to die. And then the judgment. People die physically. This old heart quits ticking. The next breath that the Bible says comes from God doesn't come. And they take what they call people out for health reasons, put them deeply enough under the sod, so as their bodies rot, our air will not become even more polluted than it is now. And we seek to put flowers on the grave, but there's no way you can make it beautiful. It's ugly. It's final. It brings men to face God. I wish I'd come out there and put my arm around you. Beg you, don't die like you are now. Don't make out life. You don't believe there's a supreme God. You know there is. Don't tell me nothing to it. You know there is. You know you're not a hog or a dog or a cat. You know that the fact that there isn't anybody listening now that doesn't have tremendous responsibilities in many different directions. It's all the proof you need that you're more than an animal. And if you're more than an animal, you're a responsible creature who got here somewhere, way, and you didn't do it yourself. Oh, I wish I could sit down beside you in this fastest growing section to tell me in God's earth where people come here as they did to the oil city to make money. Oh, I wish I could constrain that it's not nice to die without God. To die without hope is not nice. Dixie was the queen of the dance hall girls of that wicked city, 27 years old. The married and divorced seven times. She brought a man up to my little study one time, wanted me to perform a marriage ceremony, and I wouldn't do it. She cussed me out. When got somebody else. Not long after that, that beautiful queen, saying it not yet shown in her face, lovely, lovely, beautiful. She was in the arms of a man on the dance floor of the public 25 cent dance hall. And another man came and a commotion started and a gun went off. Instead of hitting the other man, it lodged into the vitals of Dixie. And they took her to the hospital, and after a while, my phone rang, and they said, Preacher, Dixie, everybody knew Dixie. Preacher, Dixie's dying, and she's calling for you. And I went to that hospital room where that beautiful young lady lay. The doctor left and the nurse let me in the room. She whispered, I'll leave you alone. She's only a few minutes left and you can't hurt her. And I went and sat beside the dying Dixie. And I began to say, Dixie? And at first she was so near gone, she didn't hear me. And then she was aroused a little bit. And in a bleary sort of way, says that you preacher? I said, yes, Dixie. 
I said, Dixie, you sent for me. What can I do for you? And she said, Dixie, she said, Brother Preacher, call me Brother Preacher. I'm dying, and I'm afraid to die. Bless God, I hope you never get the way you smile. You wouldn't be afraid to die without hope. And without God. And she said, Preacher, don't let me go to hell. Now, don't sit out there and tell me you don't believe all that proof about hell. You know there's a hell. Sin brings hell right here on this earth. God would have to make the whole thing different if there's any different in the life to come. You know. She said, don't let me go to hell. It's awful pity that you and I live in a day when nobody will talk that way so they just got about three, four breaths left. Don't let me go to hell. And if you've got a heart, that'll sort of break it. Don't let me go to hell. And I had to say, Dick said, I can't keep you out of hell. Well, she said, for God's sake, pray for me, preacher. I said, Dick said, appears to me it's too late to pray. Well, she said, my God, preacher, I've got but a little while later and I don't want to go to hell. I said, too late to pray. Is there any help for me? And I said, yes. This is unbelievable, my folks, this morning. This is unexplainable. But I said to a Dixie, if in your last dying breath and strength you could lay hold of the Christ of the gospel, that'd be hope. That's the wonder and the incredibility of the grace of God. And she said, for God's sake, preacher, how can I do that? And I said, the gospel is the death and enthronement of Jesus Christ and the command to repent. And I said, there's just one hope for you. Dick said, God commands people to repent. There's never been anybody saved yet who missed out here. And don't get in a theological argument here when you're dealing with a sinner. Oh, hear me. God knows if you can repent in your own strength, take to it, brother. And if you find you can't become a seeker after God's grace and mercy, that he'll grant you the ability to turn on yourself and agree with God and take your place as a guilty sinner with only one plea, my only hope, my only plea. Christ Jesus died, and he died for me. And I preached the Dixie. And I preached that God saves sinners upon the condition of repentance and faith. And he does, and not apart. And she heard me. And then with what I thought was a wrench of her body that would kill her, she turned and faced the wall. Never such heart-breaking, racking of a body did I hear and watch as she literally sobbed in agony, with a face turned toward the wall. And I sat there, said, dumb, I didn't know what on God's earth to do. And then she turned back to me. You mean tell me there isn't hell. You mean tell me God don't let folks see a picture where they're going. The scripture I know says you won't have to cross Jordan alone. It's the scripture, that song scripture. And it's also so for lost men. You need to tell me there's a hell, not a hell. I saw it mirrored on her face. You need to tell me 
when death you come, that you'll be brave if you have no hope. No, sir, you'll be scared. And she turned to me, and she said, Preacher, I can't repent. And she died. I can't repent. And she died. I can't come clean with God. I can't take my place as a sinner. I can't own myself to be under just condemnation. I can't claim only thing, only one thing. That is that I'm vile. The gospel says he's precious. You're living in a day now when the millions who are still alive and will go to work tomorrow morning. This preacher is afraid have reached the place, not on their deathbeds, when they can't repent either. That time when a space was given for repentance and the mercy and providence of God, those times when God held back his awful judgment and the lightning lightened up the pathway and men were confronted with the living Lord. And they deliberately turned their back and went the other way. Those times are in the past. Now there's no lightning crossing the path of men and women as they plunge in their blindness toward the chasm of eternal hell and God's judgment. Dixie said, I can't repent. And Dixie, if this book tells the truth, went out to another experience. When she'd experienced what the Bible calls the second death. That awful thing the scripture says, don't let it hurt you. If you got ears to hear, hear, he said. If you do, the second death won't hurt you. That death, not of the tissues of this body, not when the brain quits functioning, not after a while we're learning when the heart quits beating, but the second death, spiritual, eternal. on the wages of sin. The experience in his awful finality of the sentence God passed on every human being yonder in the garden dying thou shalt surely die. These glasses say you're off born of dying. My body's pretty well wild. Ralph Barnard dying. But praise the Lord. For the hope of the resurrection. For the fellowship of the living Lord. Praise God, I found a hiding place. And I rejoice in the hope. I'll not be heard of the second death. The Bible says three things about this awful second death. It's eternal banishment from the very presence of God. To you who are troubled, Paul said, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, with his angels of might in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting.
wanting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's awful. I, I can't even talk about it. To be banished for long eternity. No wonder they make fun of the Bible now. No wonder it's fool folks who way back down to maybe they dumb but not by our smart people. Because it is so men and women who go out through physical death into the hands of a thrice holy God or in for being excommunicated from the very presence of God. The Bible says of the second death that it's an eternal dying. Mark chapter 9 has a word. I don't know exactly what it means, but says every man shall be salted, preserved with fire. I reckon that means that you'll be in a state of death, but you'll never die. Eternal death. The Bible speaks of the second death being cast into the lake of fire. Is that just a picture? I guess so. I don't know. But it's awful. You mean tell me you're still dumb enough to believe that nice people give to their neighbors not responsible for their own birth, not able to decide when they're going to die. You mean tell me folks like that? You mean tell me somebody's going to pick them up forcibly while they scream? My Lord said, when you send those fellows and they start harvesting this outfit, he said they're going to be weeping and wailing. I, I, I say that's rough. I would just throw that old Bible away. I would. It's one graveyard around here pretty soon. Pretty close. I would. If I didn't know by every ache of my body and tiredness of my brain that I'm dying. I can't throw, they afford to throw away the only book that tells me that there's something on the other side. And that for those who've been able to find rest in Jesus Christ, that's something on the other side is the bliss of glory and the companionship of God. It's the lake of fire or it's the new Jerusalem. It's the comfort of God or it's the torment of hell. It's crossing the river Jordan praising God for it's going out into the hands of the living God. Who alone has power. But God kept with his power, he has determination. The CESP cast people into the lake of fire. When old P.T. Martin lay dying on the second floor of the Baptist Hospital in Jackson, Mississippi, everybody that could move got up on the second floor, every orderly and doctor and nurse and patient that could walk, hobble on crutches or go in a wheelchair. That hospital almost suspended operation for several hours crowded in the corridors and rooms of the second floor of the Baptist Hospital in Jackson, Mississippi, 
to hear old man T.T. T. Martin die. He had a little piping voice for youngsters who never heard him. And guess how he died. He died singing on Jordan. Oh, I cast the wishful eye. And he sang, Oh, who will come and go with me? Where my possess and It isn't a joke. It's so good. This world hasn't got anything like this. for being an enemy. Not only a child in your own self, but of everybody you know. Thirty odd years ago, we in Denton, Texas, we took the body of our only child, put her there in the seminary, in the cemetery. Wife and I had never seen that grave but once. About 37 years since she's been gone. She's three and a half years old. Oh, God knows. Hallelujah, what a privilege to be in a holy war when all hell seems to pop against us, when the tide seems to go in the other direction. Hallelujah for the privilege. Well, what little I weigh. To join hands with every blood, but blood redeems, child of bloodstained Jesus. And tell this generation, you're not going to rob us of the hope of the resurrection. Oh, sir, you're not going to do it. Come on, you little smart aleck, you're going to lose. Come on and bring all your doubts. I got 10,000 times more than you got. Your alibis, they're no good. In the face of the fact that you are headed right straight toward the grave. And that that grave opens up eternity. For good or bad. But J. Frank Norris preached the funeral of our little baby girl. I told you a story. He started to preach it. But all he could do was cry, and 3,000 people filed by and looked at the little baby, beautiful, because she was ours. And that preacher, he couldn't preach, he just bawled and said, I can't talk. And then we followed that little white casket out to the cemetery, and that afternoon after the funeral in the morning, we went. Wife and I slipped away and went out, and already the flowers were withering under the hot summer sun. She knelt on one side of the grave, and I left all another. And us men ain't worth killing. God will just kill us and get us out of the bends anyhow. 
Most of why you find the woman seemed like got more sense than we got. She had more than I did. She looked up into my face with just kids. And she, through the tears, said, Honey, Patty Sue's not here. She's with the Lord. She's with the Lord. Got that out of here, brother. Got that out of here because God, knowing that Christ died, because men had to die, God, knowing people had faced him out yonder, and that eternity is not a picnic or a joke, it's a fact. God did something about it. Amen. Oh, we're in a fight now. We can't win it with weapons of the flesh. But if our hearts burn within us, because by experience we've entered in to these great benefits of the love of God in turning his son on, his back on a world that hope might be born, that the sting might be taken out of death. That glory would yet conquer. It's appointed unto man once to die. So Christ came and died. It's appointed unto men to come to the judgment. So Christ came and died. And you desperately need to run to Christ. Bring you by your head. I wish you'd favor the preacher this morning briefly. I wish every eye would be closed. And I wonder how many people here this morning, you have a reasonable hope that you belong to Christ. He's yours and you're his. But to somebody here this morning, you have every reason to believe not in Christ. You know who they are. You're burdened about them. I'd love to see the Christians that know somebody in this service that you believe to be on the road to hell and the judgment. I want to ask you to do something for me. I'd love to see you lift your hand. If you're a Christian, there's somebody in this service that you believe lost. And then in the camp, lift your hands, Christian. Let's see. A little higher so I could see. Our Father, give us, give us a spirit of prevail right now. Lord, I wish I knew how to beg people. These who lifted the hands, I won't turn them over to you, but ask them to intercede now and not quench the spirit. Now as we come to this awful moment when we always tremble, And we know that life's just a bundle of decisions and that people will do things here right now in the next minute. It just scares me to death, Lord. But it's worth it because of the hope of the gospel. I pray that you'll be kind, touch people, woo people, constrain people, Enable people right now to close with the Christ of the gospel. Oh God, please do it. I wonder if you'd stand, nobody leave, nobody put on a coat, nobody will whisper. You honor the preacher's request. This is a desperate moment. Let everybody stand, will you please?
Christ's name I stand here and beg you be reconciled to God. Don't go away from this building without seeking the Lord. Don't do this. Please don't do it. We stand here to pray with you. We'd help you if we knew how. Don't wait till you just got about five breaths left. I've seen so much of that. Yeah. Run toward God in Jesus Christ. Unashamedly say, I need Jesus. I desperately need him. And I come as a seeker. A person standing next to you. Maybe on his road to hell. Pray for him. Pray for him. Yeah, I stand. I won't shake your hand. Run to Christ. Come down here and say, I must get to thee. I must get to thee. I must. I must. I must in my ear. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L, 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.